I'm going to do a little commercial here. Am I on there? There you go. Uh, make sure you are here uh, this next week for this uh, anniversary celebration. Uh, this church has come a long way within this community, and I've been part of that for about 40-some years, seeing the church grow. I remember when we used to have community Bible studies over here in the old part of the church, and then we'd break off into our different segments of denominations. I remember a lot of the pastors that pastored behind this pulpit, and uh, some of them were very dear friends. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing, is it Doug? Pastor Doug's coming back, am I right? I'm looking forward to that, okay? You know what? He, he, he shook my hand and when I become a member here. But make sure you're here, and make sure you're there for, the, for that uh, uh, meal that's coming up and for the messages that will be preached. And I believe we're having a song sing, sing song. Am I right? Okay, is Bill Gaither going to be here for that? Okay, I just want to check. All right. Uh, well, this is the second part of the book of Philippians. We covered chapter 1 and 2. Last week we're going to do chapter 3. And chapter 4 today, uh, I know this, that when I graduated from college, what they taught us in homiletics, which is basically how do you structure a sermon, the first book that every preacher that came out of that college preached on was Ephesians. And I decided to do something different, okay, with Philippians. It's a wonderful book. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to put another plug if if you're not coming to Sunday school, come to Sunday school. I I I'll tell you, we we are having a great time in our our Sunday school class. And I, I quote unquote, I had a word for Joyce back there. I said, "Rejoice, Joyce," because we studied that today. But you need to be here for Sunday school education and the Word of God. It's good for us. Be here in church. Be loving on one another. That's the reason I'm sort of wandering around saying hello to. I'm not, I'm not real good at names. If I call you brother and sister, I've told you this before, that means I probably have forgotten your name. I don't want to call you something that you're not, okay? But I get around, and, and we sit over here, we can come over here and, and mix it up a little bit so that you get to know your brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? Amen? I heard it over here because these, these people sit close. How about over here? Amen to that. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're in Philippians chapters 3 and 4, but before we begin, let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, it is a honor, Lord God, and it is a place of uh, service to stand behind this sacred desk, to preach your word, to know the men that have stood behind this proclaiming the word of God, God, it's an awesome responsibility. Lord, I, I, we're, we're insufficient, as the Apostle Paul said, for this work. But our sufficiency is not in ourselves; It's in God, our Savior, and in the Word of God. So help these stammering lips, Lord, to speak your word with confidence, not in myself, but in the confidence that's found in Jesus Christ, of whom we just sing, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Amen. Now we begin with uh, chapters 3 and 4, sort of an overview. I, I borrowed this from uh, some of my studies I've been doing on this. Uh, chapter 3 and 4, and I want to ask a series of questions to begin with, and I want you to think about it. Okay, think about what I'm going to say. The first question is this, where have you come from and where are you now? The song that was in my heart was, He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He put a song in my heart today, a song of praise. Hallelujah. Where have you come from? Some of you may have been raised in religion. Some of you may have been raised in a God-fearing home. But all of us as Christians, at some point or another, had to have a direct, direct meeting with Jesus Christ. 
Who do men say that I am? Jesus asked the disciples. They had all kinds of public opinion polls on that. They said, who do you say that I am? And that's the confession that each one of us in coming to Christ must say, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Where have you come from? Some of you are, 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 are unwilling to share your story because it's so dark. Some of you may have come from a, a, a better situation. But I'm telling you, if you've come to Christ, things change. They change. You were old, and now you're new. How many of you feel old this morning? Yeah. Huh? My brother down here, he's going to have knee surgery tomorrow. Is that right, brother? Okay, I bet he's feeling a little bit old, okay? We're, we're hoping that you'll be able to do what you and I were talking about. And I don't know if you talk, talk about that here at the church, but uh, maybe the possibility he'll be dancing again. And he said, well, that'll be a miracle because I've never danced before. So <laughs> where did you come from? The second part of that question is, where are you now, right now? In your mind and your heart, where are you? I love Jesus. I'm a good person. I voted right. Now, that can have all kinds of connotations, brother. It can have all kinds of connotations. I'm not here to start a conflict. Okay? I've got a good job. I'm retired. I'm young. I'm old. Where are you now? Those issues all boil down into where you came from and who came into your heart. I am in Christ. No matter what happens to America, and I pray that we see some good come out of the next four years. Amen? I'm praying that God will help us to be united as Americans. Amen? But my greatest hope is this. That Christ will be established in our hearts by faith. Amen? Where you come from? Where are you at? Second question. Is the rubbish you lived in still where you are now? You understand what I'm talking about there. The old man. Okay. If you're in Christ, he is in the business of helping you to remember, I slayed the old man. Well, sometimes that's hard to deal with, isn't it? You ever rub shoulders with the wrong person at the wrong time? You know, Jesus said, well, you know, you don't strike your brother. You don't strike this individual. But you think the thoughts, amen, or oh me. You're living in the same rubbish, the same way of thinking. One old preacher once said, it's called stinking thinking. It's the way that we try to deal with this day-to-day -day stuff. Are we still the same way we were 10 years ago, 5 years ago, a year ago, a month ago? Where are you now? Third question, where do you live? And how do you live? I'm not talking about your homes. The one thing about that hailstorm back last May, it made sure that all of us felt the impact of that. Amen? Boy, we went through it, didn't we? We were at home, we, we were down at the, the uh, recital down there in Eckley. And I just I started looking at those clouds, and I, I made a beeline home. I got home just in time to line up all the vehicles of my daughter, my son-in-law, ours, in the tree belt, exactly in the path of that hail. Okay, let me just give you a, a word of advice. If I'm backing up, don't get behind me because I still have my mirror broken on the driver's side. I may not see you. Well, we, it, would, it leveled us. We're all on the same level field. Where are you now? Let's go beyond just the house or a storm. Where are you? Where do you live? I had an old gospel song come into my heart. I have a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. Have you been thinking about heaven? Have you been thinking about going to heaven? One old pastor one time says, how many of you are thinking about going to heaven? 
Every hand went up in the church except one. One old guy sat right about over in here. He says, are you thinking about going to heaven? And that man replied, well, yeah, but I thought you were trying to get a boatload today. <laughs> heaven. We read of a place called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. This hope in God's word is given. How beautiful heaven must be. This is not just the song of us old people. This is the song of the heart of those who know that we have a home here, but our real home is over there. Is our mind there? Next question. Friction creates fire. Fire is contagious. Now you can take it the good way. Man alive, we need to be the, the most friendliest people in this community. Huh? You go up to somebody that is having a very bad day. You ever done this? Okay. You get up to some of those, those uh, ladies that are trying to check us out at Shop Hall, and they just had a very grumpy Presbyterian ahead of them, and here we come as a Baptist. I hope there's Presbyterians listening to this. I know a lot of them. I've preached over there before a couple times. I'm not mad. It could be us who are angry, are frustrated, and we take it out on the tellers. Amen? Or oh me. See, some of you are looking down your shoes. God bless you. Fires create fire. We all go through things, don't we? We all struggle. There is not one prophet, priest, or minister in this nation or world that can promise you a stress-free life. There's none. There's nobody that can promise you you're going to get out of this without a scar and you're going to have all the money you ever wanted. You're going to have all the health that you ever wanted. There's not one that can promise you that 100% certainty. And if they want to disagree with me, I'll ask them to put their airplanes online. Let's make a bet. Now that's sort of a side thing. That's for free. We go through struggles, tempted and tried. We're oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. Amen? Fire creates fire, and it can become contagious. I'm not going to promise you you're going to have perfect health. I'm not going to promise you you're going to have all the money you ever wanted. I'm not going to promise you the best-looking husband or the best-looking wife. I'm not going to promise you any of that. I'm going to probably promise you this, Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of all. Our forefathers paid a price for coming into this community 70 years ago. Our forefathers paid a price when John de Calvin was over there in Switzerland writing the foundational studies of the Word of God they were tied to stakes and set on fire. They sacrificed their lives for the truth. I'm telling you, fire creates fire. It's contagious. The reason you're all here and I'm here this morning is because somebody paid a price. And through the centuries and the decades, we are the recipients of this blessing. Let's start a fire. Let's start a fire. I'm not talking wildfire. They have, the, the fire department here in town will not allow me anywhere near matches. I was out burning tumbleweeds. Anybody ever do that? Anybody ever do that near a house? Anybody ever do that next to somebody else's house? That's not the ty type of fire I'm talking about. Thank goodness. I'm talking about the love of God. The fellowship of the believers. The joy of being with each other. And taking it out and saying, you know, this is worth giving. This is worth spreading. This is worth talking about. We can sit and we can banter until the, the cows come home about what's happened over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of years. You know what? He brought me out 
of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. Glory to God. I got something better to talk about. Amen? Let's look at the next question. What is the foundation for unity? Well, we're all here. We're all unified. How many of you are German of extract? Can I see your hands? There we got a couple. There we go. Okay. Uh, anybody here Norwegian? Ah, uh, thank you. I, see, I knew that. Okay. I say that because I, I, I love the people up in North Dakota. Any, anybody here Swedes? Okay. Anybody here a man? Come on, guys. You got to put your hand up on that one. Otherwise, we're going to have a prayer meeting right now. We come from different backgrounds. Different. And Jesus said this. I'm going to take all of you together, and I'm going to make you my bride. Now, brother, I don't know about you. As a man, I have a problem being viewed as a bride. But I know what he's talking about. That which Jesus gave his life for, for you. You as individuals and us as corporate. We need one another. Can the hand say to the brain, I don't have need of you? Can the foot say to the arm, I have no need of you? Brother, you're going to have that knee surgery, and you're going to find out that you need that knee. Amen? Melody, am I right? We need one another. I'm thankful you're here, every one of you. I'm thankful. Because we're part of the body of Christ. This is my home. I have family that I live with, and I love them to death. But this is my home. You are my people. I love every one of you. Amen and amen. Next question. Well, let me go back to that one here. What is the basis of unity? Communion. Common. Union. Next question. What are we going through? And how do we handle stress? Uh, oh my, or yes, sir. I have no clue what every one of you are doing what you're facing, what you're going through. I know my wife is about to have a, a trip tomorrow. There's two things you need to pray for. Melody's having uh, her eye looked at. She is losing sight in her one eye. Okay, she's got to go up there and see what's going on with that. That's the first prayer request. That, that everything goes and we find a medical answer to this. The second thing is it's in a clinic that's in the mountains. They call it Longmont, but Longmont stretches a long, long way into the mountains. There's only one road to this clinic, and I googled the map, okay, and if you get off on the wrong road, you're ending up going nowhere. So her uh, meeting and scheduled meeting with the doctor tomorrow is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Pray that we make it out before it gets dark. Okay, otherwise I have become a mountain man. I'm just telling you. I don't know what you're going through. I know this, that when I was 18, I thought I could conquer the world. When I became a minister back in 1978, I thought I could conquer a town of 223. I moved down here to Yuma. I had a dream of pastoring or preaching in a church that was filled with people and standing up there. And God spoke to my heart. He said, uh, I want you to understand your ministry. It's the ministry of obscurity. Uh, you judge this. You know, I'm not into listening to voices and things like that, but I, I knew God was speaking to my heart. What do you mean, obscurity? He says, I don't mean that it's unimportant. I mean that it's unseen. So most of my ministry for over 40 years has been little things, helping out, preaching where I could, 
I loved the nursing home ministry in this town. I, I loved helping little old ladies, and forgive me for my language for saying that. You define whether you're a little old lady or not, okay? I'm not trying to be mean. Because the Bible says pure religion and undefiled before the God the Father is this, the book of James, that you help and assist the widow, the orphan, and keep yourself unspotted before the world. Let me tell you something. You go out here on Wednesday, and you see those little kids coming. Some of them don't go to church here. And you've got teachers and worshipers and livers of Christ who are with those little kids. You come here Thursday, and you see the ministry of meals and the ministry of the Word. There's those high schoolers. Some of them don't go to church here. You see these type of things going on in church and outside the church. God's got to work for all of us, every one of us. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. I've had people here in this church say, well, we could never do what you've been called to do. I have been called to a ministry, small ministry, but could have good impact. You understand that? That's where my joy and my glory is. What about you? What is your call? Well, I, I can't do nothing. Oh, I don't believe that. There's not one of you. When, when God called Moses to build the, the, the tabernacle out there in the wilderness, he didn't look for the ones that you would normally look for. He found people willing to be used. That's a good word. Now, let's go on. i got to finish this. Uh, how do you find the word content? Well, ultimately des decide, define who you are, who you associate with, who you trust, and how you handle stress. Because that is a major theme of these last two chapters of Philippians. Be content. Our society is built on a lot of discontentment. Can you get an amen to that? Yeah. Yeah. What type of uh, cereal did you grow up with? I'm, I'm going to the oldsters right now. What type of cereal did we grow up? Cheerios. Okay. Plain Cheerios. Am I right? Cheerios. What else? What, what other type of cereal did you grow up? Oatmeal. Okay. Did you grow up with generic oatmeal or did you get Quaker Oats? Quaker Oats. Okay. Uh, what, what did you have if you didn't eat cereal or you didn't have oatmeal? You had eggs and bacon and toast and orange juice. Yeah. Okay. Have you been to the grocery store, some of you older people, and gone down the cereal aisle? Huh? It is a candy store. Am I right or am I right? Content. Our society is building... It's built upon the fact that you may like what you have now, but we got something better. And I'm not putting down the way that our society is built. What I'm saying is it has also created within us discontentment. Okay, you don't like the way you look? We got ways to fix that. You take that for whatever way you want to take that, okay? Brother, we are losing hair. hair. We got ways that... That they used to have, this is no joke, back, back I believe in the 80s, if for men losing hair, they had, the, it was like a magic marker that you could mark and it could look like hair. What it looked like was a magic marker on your head. <laughs> That's a true, am I, how many saw those commercials, okay? I, I, I was scared to death one time with a farmer out here in the, the 90s, went out to the south, he had beautiful hair, beautiful hair, came to, came to church. And he was out there working. He had his uh, farmer's cap on, seed cap on. And we went inside to talk. And he was sweating. And he took that hat off. And his hair went with it. His ball is a cue ball. Okay. Well, I was shocked to my foundation. Okay. Discontentment. Discontentment. Now, if you can make yourself look good, that's fine. But that's not what I'm talking about. Our society is built on the discontentment of its citizens. If you don't like this, we've got something else. Well, maybe you're supposed to like that. 
How are you defining contentment in your family? Final question, what worries do you have? What do you trust? And who do you trust? Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, verse through chapter 4, verse 1, Paul talks about his past. I just wish everyone, and I, I love our Sunday school teachers, but I just wish all of you had been in our class this morning. Okay, because we had a conversation about salvation. Okay, and I told you, I believe last week, salvation, the Greek word is soterion. It means the totality of salvation, everything that God is. He poured into his son, Jesus, and Jesus gave it all to us. Can you say amen to that? Did he save you until you uh, stub your toe and say the wrong word? Did he save you until you voted right? Did he save you until you became a conservative? Did he save you? You see what I'm getting at? He didn't wait until you reformed yourself because reformation doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Transformation does. You were old and now you're born again. That's what the term means. Chapter 3, verse 1, and cha through chapter 4, verse Paul's talking about his zeal. You know you can have a zeal for God and hurt people? You ever met somebody like that? Not that. They're going to read you your riot act? I've been in services before. I ain't going to say where or when or how or what. I've been in services where people read your mind. I am not saying at all that this is of God because it was not a God. I was a young Christian when this happened to me. I was sitting in a service in a circle, a darkened room, and this false prophet had come in, and he was reading everybody's mind, and he came to me, and I was just, I was just 14, 15, 15 years old. I didn't know nothing about nothing. I just wanted more of God. You ever been there? I'll just eat and eat and eat the things of God. And some of it isn't a God. Sitting there in that my chair, came up and pointed his finger to me and he said, You want to be a missionary. And I jumped out of my seat and started shouting, screaming, hollering. Because that's what I wanted to be. Because I, I wanted to go to South America and serve God. And God is my witness, and my wife's sitting over there. When I proposed to her to marry me, I was one of uh, just months out of, of high school, sitting out there where uh, the, uh, the feedlot is, east of town. There used to be a little farmhouse over there, sitting there after a Sunday morning service. Looked her in the eye, and I don't know what got into me. I looked her in the eye and said, would you marry me? And she said, yes, immediately. And I thought she said it too fast. <laughs> she didn't understand the question. <laughs> I said, would you marry me? If I became a missionary to Mexico and I got ate by cannibals, that was my marriage proposal. Brother, right here, second row, did you have a similar proposal? How many of you have ever heard of a proposal like that? That's what I was offering her. I was going to be course number one to the cannibals in Mexico, and I'm not even sure there's cannibals down there. She said, yes. I still haven't gone to Mexico. Because <laughs> that's not where God wanted me. He wanted me to be trained in North Dakota. To take over a church of 18 people. Move back to Yuma. And spend 30 years here as a minister in this community. Go out for 12 years to Tennessee and serve Alzheimer patients. Come back here, become a member of this church, and fill in until we get a pastor. That was God's purpose. Did I see that? No. All I saw was cannibals. <laughs> Melody, are you glad they didn't eat me? Thank you. Paul talked about his self-righteousness. Paul talked about his filth and in his zeal. I can't imagine 
being at a place where a Christian man is being stoned to death because he stood and said, I see the Son of God standing on the right hand of the Father. And they took him out, and he agreed to the mur. I could not even begin to imagine watching a man die by stoning. I could not even imagine destroying people's homes taking wives and children and putting them in prison and dragging them down to the jails in Jerusalem. I can't even imagine taking a mission up to Damascus on the behest of the high priest of the Most High God in Jerusalem to arrest Christians. I can't even imagine that type of pride but I can imagine the mercy of God when he was knocked off his horse. Saul, why are you persecuting me? I don't even know who you are, Lord. Who are you? I am Jesus whom you persecute. He was blinded three days. I cannot even imagine Ananias getting a voice speaking to him. Go down. I love this. Paul was in the local Motel 6 there in Damascus. He said, go down to the Motel 6. I love this. On straight street. Pray for the man. And I love, this is the way we do sometimes with God. Well, God, don't you know he kills people? The followers of Jesus, go. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. He says, I have called him to suffer for my name. You notice he didn't say pay for his sins. He said suffer for his name. So Ananias went down there. He said, Brother Saul, I don't know what's going to come. I'm going to put my hands on you. I'm going to pray for you. Paul received his sights. You're reading what that man wrote 2,000 years ago. For you, for me. He knew self-righteousness. He knew false zeal. He knew the price to pay for his walk with God. And he tells the story here in this chapter about what that was like. What has Christ done for you, my brothers and sisters? It's summed up in chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship. Now hear me on this. Ye who voted, ye who are American. I love America. I really do, and I did vote. I got relatives that think I didn't, but I did. I love this nation. I know we need God in this nation. Again, we need to return to righteousness. But at the end of the day, when I lay my head on my pillow, I may have had a bad day. And listen, when you get old, you start having bad days. All the old people said amen. You ache, you creak, you crack. Amen. Struggle. At the end of the day, I have a home prepared, made for me, just over in the glory land. The great hope that we have in Jesus Christ, no matter what we're going through, is that Christ will come again. And if he doesn't come again before we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment your eyes close here, they open in heaven. I read this last week. What we must worry about? Is it going to hurt? I cannot promise anything. But I can tell you this. It's going to cost you something to follow Christ. But the cost is going to be worth it. One moment... 
My eyes are opened. They're shut. They open instantly in heaven. Isn't that glorious? That's what this gospel, good news is about. Now, let's go on. Chapter 4, verse 2 through 9 challenges us, though. Yeah, how many of you are alive? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, come on, come on. Rodney, yeah, okay, back row. Okay, we got, okay, we got, we got a unity back there. If you're alive, you've got time for God to be shown through you. That's what chapter 4, verse 2 through 9 talks about. And he centers this in two people. Now, sad to say, ladies, this, this was two women. This could be two men. It could be a man and a woman. It doesn't matter. But this was actually two women, Yodia and Sintaiche. Okay? I don't know how to describe this, because Paul doesn't describe what was going on, but they were at loggerheads. You ever been there? How many of you are married? How many of you ever disagree with your wife? You're very brave, back row. You're very brave, raising your hand. Where is your wife? Your wife is God. Your wife is God, yeah. The old song, My Wife Hates Me to Sing, is, it goes, a man's got to do what a man's got to do, and I'm going to do what my wife tells me to. <laughs> That'll make it a lot easier for us, men. I don't know what was going on between these two women, but they were at loggerheads, and the loggerheads was creating some problems within the body of Christ. Who are you for? You for Yodia or you for Sintaiche? Paul addressed that. Notice he doesn't say what the issue is. The Holy Spirit's really leading him in writing this. Does it say what the issue is? What he calls for is unity. I asked you how many are German, Irish, Ukrainian, Scottish, Scandinavian? You know, I used to say, well, you know, I've got a German attitude. My wife looked at me and says, what's that mean? I said, I've got a hard head. It's hard to teach me anything. She said, well, that's interesting. I'm Irish, and I thought that's what happened to me. <laughs> there are times where there are personality conflicts, and sometimes someone's right and someone's wrong, and sometimes everybody's wrong, and sometimes everybody's right. I do not want to be a part of the body of Christ in creating division. I won't. You know why? Because when I entered the body of Christ through faith in Christ, I'm a part of the bride of Christ. Now, you men, you work through that one, like I said before. I'm a part of the body of Christ. You have something to offer from the youngest ones to the oldest ones. Oh, I can't teach. Well, then don't worry about that. Find out where you fit. Find out what you can do. Come to Sunday school. Listen to these teachings. Get behind whoever we end up with a pastor here. But let's work together. Together. Not for the name over the door, but for the Lord Jesus Christ. This town needs Christ. We've got 15 churches in this community. On any given average, any given average, Sunday morning, there's less than 600 people of the 4,000 people of Yuma that go to a church. We have a work to do. You know, we as Baptists have a work to do. Look around you. There's room for some of our neighbors to be in here with us. Amen? Amen. Oh, I pray for them, brother. I pray for them. I'm going to tell you, God may say, go to them. Oh, I don't know how to preach. I'm not asking you to preach. I'm not asking you to teach them a lesson. I'm not even ta uh, asking you to know the four spiritual laws. How many know what the four spiritual laws are? Guess what I thought. The issue is bigger than that. If you're going to show somebody Jesus, understand what I'm saying. Be Jesus to them. 
Well, you don't know what type of sins they've been involved with. Jesus knew the sin of the woman caught in the very act of adultery. And as a couple of we, uh, uh, weeks ago, I preached on Zacchaeus up in the tree. He was a Democrat. <laughs> he loved taking taxes. Now, if you're a Democrat, just love me, okay? Okay. Jesus stopped right underneath the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, get down. I'm going to go eat in your house today. You remember that sermon? He got down. He was so happy. The only people who weren't happy were the people who were the in crowd. Well, he's eating with sinners. He's eating with tax collectors. He's eating with a Democrat. What did Jesus say? Salvation came to this house. I want to see that. I don't want anybody to be written off in this community, because to write them off means they're headed for hell. God, give us the compassion and the boldness and the love that we will do what our songs say. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. You might be the catalyst for someone coming to Christ. Amen? Now, let's close this up. Chapter 4, verse 10 through 23. This is the closing. Thanks. Now note this, what the Apostle Paul said. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now we can take this all different directions. Okay. What is contentment? Oh, sleeping in a tent in January in Colorado. Ah, uh, you're crazy, okay? You really are, okay? We need contentment, okay? And you have to define that contentment as God helps you to define that. What does that mean? Paul said, in whatever state that I am in, I'm going to be content. Because you're going to go through times of toughness. You're going to go through times that there, things are tight. And then God has the ability to bring you into broad places where you as a sheep in the sheepfold of God, you're going to eat green pastures. You've got to be content whether you have it or you don't have it. Okay? I just told this. This is, this is for free, Joyce. Okay? You mark it. Okay? I'm not going to charge you for listening to this. Oh, if I could only win Powerball. Oh, okay. I'm, am I treading on feet? Uh, contentment. Contentment. Go, go back and understand this country has a lot of discontentment in it right now. Politically, morally, spiritually, financially. Whatever state I'm in, I'm going to be content. That's what he's talking about in the end of this book. He goes on and he says this. I know how to be abased. Basically, that means to do without. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. And here is the zinger, Christians. I can do all things. Through Christ, who strengthens me. You're not going to do it on your own. You need somebody bigger than you. Jesus, carry the wheel or drive the wheel or take the wheel. Help me to trust you in good times and bad times. Now, I'm not going to sit here and thank God for a hailstorm. But I know good came out of it. It, it united a community because we were all in the same boat, weren't we? There's still people in those boats. It's something we can learn from that. Individual tragedies, we've got to walk through it, be content. Corporate tragedies, we've got to learn to walk together and be content. Either way, Paul says be content. In the midst of this, as I close is the second song of the book of Philippians. Two songs. The first one we looked at last week. 
This is the second song. These were ancient hymns. They didn't, they didn't write it down per se, like what we have in our song books or hymn books. They began to sing these songs, and it's, it's got a different cadence to it than what we who have uh, uh, westernized ears to, okay? You get an A, B, D, you know, on the guitars and all that. It was sang almost in a unity way. They didn't have instruments. They didn't have a praise group. This is the second song. Look at the first verse. For our citizenship is in heaven. Isn't that glorious? Amen. Verse 2, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is hope for us. Verse 3, who will transform this lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body? The bill that you see here is not going to be a man losing hair and getting whiter. Amen? I'm going to have a body. And the neat thing about it, he's going to give us a new name. You ever hear that song? There's a new name written down in glory. Yeah. Read about that in the book of Revelations. Now, how are we going to know each other? Same way we know each other here. My brothers and sisters. Huh? Are you going to look the same? I don't know how you're going to look. You've got a lot of bald-headed guys in here. I don't know if you're going to be bald. or It ain't going to matter. You'll never die. You're going to have peace. You're going to have a mansion. I had a man one time here in town. Some of you know him. I'm not going to mention his name. We got talking about going to heaven, getting our mansion up in heaven. And he, he said his, his nephew was there with us, and he said, you know, when I get to heaven, he says, I, I want a junkyard. I want everything in that junkyard to be made of gold. Now, some of you know who I'm talking about. He was a loving man, loved Jesus. Then his nephew spoke up. He said, well, if you're getting a junkyard of gold, I want a semi-truck of gold. And I sat there, and I thought, I don't want to live on that side of heaven. Oh, we, we can't even imagine. You can read about it in the book of Revelation. Can't even imagine the things that God has prepared for us. One of the common questions been asked of me for almost two decades. Are our pets going to heaven? Are there going to be animals in heaven? I, I, I wouldn't put it beyond God of making something so wonderful. Because there will be animals in heaven. The book of Isaiah talks about some. Some of your kids in glorified body are going to be sticking their hands in the holes of snakes and bringing them home for mom and dad to see. It's in the book of Isaiah. Okay, that part of heaven, I'm not real sure I want to live next to either. What are we going to see? Your eyes cannot even begin to imagine the things that God has prepared for you. Not creaking and cracking when I lay down. Are we going to rest? Yes, the Bible talks about that. What God has prepared for those who love him. You love Jesus. You love the Lord. He's prepared all this. Over in glory. Close this up with verse 4. Verse 3, excuse me. Who will transform our lowly body that may be conformed to his glorious body. Verse 4. According to the working, are you ready for this? By which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And the book closes as I close this, this morning. Amen. There's our warning. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Barb. <laughs> what does the word amen mean? So be it. Let it be so. And I'll add, add this ancient uh, Jewish blessing. Baruch, Abba, Hashem, Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Maranatha, 
the Greek, even so come, Lord Jesus. Father God, in your name we pray. I ask that your word would be the thing that sticks in our mind. But my prayer is, is that if the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart been acceptable in your sight, my Lord, and strength and redeemer, that your people would be encouraged and grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I say amen. So be it. Let it be so.